Hi everyone, it's me. Welcome to the August wrap up. This is pretty much the last summer reads wrap up until next year, until a very, very long time. So it's a little bit bittersweet because I'm so excited for fall reads and like cozy autumn vibes. But yeah, we're, we're kind of saying goodbye to the good old summer reads this month. So yeah, I definitely read my fair share of summer themed reads, maybe more romances. I'm excited to dive back into more fantasy, maybe getting more into some thrillers, mysteries for spooky season coming up. And yeah, so in August, I ended up reading 17 books, which is the most books I've ever read in a month, apart from June, where I also read 17 books. It was another month where I just read a lot, <laughs> but that's a good thing. We love books. Just to give you guys a little bit more of a breakdown on what genres I read this month, I read eight fantasies, four romances, two thrillers, one lit fic, one mystery, one graphic novel for the very first time and also this month I celebrated reading my hundredth book of the year which means my like yearly reading challenge is complete this year I'm done from now onwards until the rest of the year it's just gonna be a continuous reading marathon with no end in sight it's just we have no limits for this year now it's like we could just read as much as we want and see how many books we end up getting to by the end of the year which is so much dang fun. So let's just get straight into it. We'll talk about the first book I read this month, which was The God of the Woods by Liz Moore. This is like a summer camp thriller. So I feel like this is actually a really good one to read at the end of summer, either in August or even September. I feel like it's a good transition book between summer and fall because this is a thriller. It takes place at summer camp. We follow a couple different characters. We have several POVs in this book. We actually have a lot of POVs and different timelines in this book but the base of the story is at the beginning of the book one of the like campers at the camp that we're following goes missing and this event just starts to uncover a lot of mysteries unsolved mysteries from the past get dug up again we dive into this world of the families that own the land that the camp is on and also the family that runs the camp we discover there's like a lot of suspicious things happening sort of behind the scenes sort of behind like closed family doors and a previous case of a mystery person from the camp from years and years and years ago is dug up again because people are sort of seeing that there's maybe some connections between these two cases. I find the title of this book a little bit like weird, not weird, but I feel like it doesn't really match the book because it's called The God of the Woods and I feel like that implies that there's some sort of like spiritual otherworldly thing happening in this book and it's really not. It's very, very much like a very literal real world mystery crime sort of a book. There's nothing to do with like spirits or gods or otherworldly like demons and stuff. It's not that kind of book. It's not like paranormal at all. It's very real world. There is like one point in the book, I'm pretty sure, where like the God of the Woods as a saying is actually mentioned in the book. So that's why it's called that. But yeah, I found the name of the book a little bit like to be not matching to the book itself, but that's okay. I did overall enjoy this book. It wasn't my favorite read of the year, but I did like it. I think if you are going into this book thinking it's gonna be a thriller, which I was because that's kind of how it was marketed to me as, it's not a fast paced thriller at all. I would say this book is actually more mystery than thriller. It's very much like just slowly uncovering bits of the past and pieces of things and putting them together. It's not fast paced, it's not gonna get Get your like adrenaline rushing. It's very much just like a slow summer camp mystery. The beginning of it actually also is very, very slow to start. I found it a little bit difficult to get into, to be honest, because we start with multiple timelines kind of right away. We start with a lot of different POVs. I think like, I can't remember exactly, but off the top of my head, I remember the beginning of the book starting with a certain POV and then every single chapter, like for the next five chapters, like changes to another person's POV, like a new POV. So it's not like the POVs are slowly and gradually introduced to you. It's just like all of a sudden right away, we get like several POVs, three different timelines. Yeah, I think it's three different timelines. It could be even more. I don't remember. I read this book at the beginning of the month. But yeah, it was just, for me, it was a little bit hard to keep track of like, okay, who is this? Who am I following? Why do I care about you? Most of the time when I'm reading these sorts of like unsolved mystery, thriller, crime type of books, I like to analyze every single detail and like gather all my information and try and guess myself like what happened. And I feel like with this book, there was just so much going on, like so many characters, so 
so many timelines that I couldn't like wrap it together all in my head. That part of my brain turned off and then I just ended up reading this book for the vibes, which is fine, but it's just not what I like signed up for going into it. I would say around like the 50% mark in this book, things start to get a little more interesting. That's when I started getting more invested into the story. And with a lot of like mystery thrillers I've read lately, the endings have been very, very predictable for me, like all the twists. And this twist was not predictable to me at all. Like I did not see it coming. So that was really refreshing. I liked that part of it. So yeah, I guess like the twist on one hand was good, but then the way this book ended, I feel like I didn't get closure from it. It kind of ended like randomly, kind of abruptly and like not in a satisfying way. Just something about the end was not like satisfying to me after like going through this entire journey it did not satisfy me which was like a little bit unfortunate this is one of those books that i'm just kind of like torn about like there are some parts of it that i really 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 liked and then some parts that i was like mm. <laughs> so that's God of the Woods. I then went on to film my video where I read some of my favorite authors' five-star reads. The first one was Shadow and Bone by Leigh Bardugo, which was Sarah J. Mass's five-star read many, many, many years ago. So if you don't know what Shadow and Bone is, I know it's a really popular series. It's set in the Grishaverse, which is like the same universe as the Six of Crows duology is set in, and also another series. I can't remember the name off the top of my head right now, but there is a third series. I think it's, it's either another duology or another trilogy that's also set in this Grishaverse. So what the heck is the Grishaverse? It's this high fantasy political world with lots of different regions. We have Grisha who are the magical people in this world and there are different types of them. So there are some that are more like corporal body types of Grisha. They can alter people's hearts or like skin or like organs or body parts and stuff like that. There are also like material Grisha. So they work with fabrics like metals maybe stuff like that. There's like elemental magic and stuff like that as well, like Storm Grisha who control winds and rain and stuff. So in the Shadow and Bone trilogy, we follow Alina Starkov who starts the book off as an orphan. She has her like BFF, what's his name? I forget his name. Um, I can't remember his name. What the heck is wrong with me? Why can't I remember his name? He's such a main character. But she has this like best friend, her guy best friend who grows up in the orphanage with her. They live in Ravka, which is a place that's been torn down a little bit by this thing called the Shadow Fold that like split the country in two and like so all their resources are divided and they're just like weak as a country right now. Alina and her BFF end up getting enlisted into the military. They get sent into the Shadow Fold to like do one of the military tasks that they have to do for their job and then all all chaos breaks loose and Alina ends up getting whisked away by this mysterious dark handsome character called the Darkling who is very very powerful and works for like the king she gets whisked away by him to do a task that she is needed for. I actually really enjoyed Shadow and Bone. I think the beginning, like the first half, the setup of it, I actually enjoyed it more than Six of Crows. I've said this in so many videos before, but I feel like in Six of Crows, we didn't get so much world building. It just kind of like dumped you into the world, kind of assumed you knew everything about the world. And like as a fantasy reader, I was able to catch on, but it wasn't, it wasn't easy for me. For some reason, there was something about this world that was kind of difficult for me to like get immersed into. Not to like understand. I feel like I could understand things, but I didn't feel like I was in the world fully while I was reading Six of Crows. And I feel like in Shadow and Bone, I think because the series came first and it's set in like pretty much the same world, I feel like we got a lot better world building and set up in this book. So I really enjoyed that. I also like immediately got attached to Alina, our main character, immediately felt like emotionally tied to her. And just right off the bat, I felt like way more invested into these characters and in the story. I will say as the book went on, the middle and end got a little bit like mushy. The plot kind of like felt short a bit, especially at the end of this book. I was like, oh, like that's, that's just the way this book is gonna end. So the ending wasn't, very satisfying for me. I feel like the ending of Six of Crows was actually better than the ending of Shadow and Bone. Just the way things tied together was a lot more satisfying and a lot more intricate and well done, where in Shadow and Bone, everything was just more simple. And it makes sense because this series was written first before Six of Crows. Yeah, I found the ending to be lackluster. I am though definitely very intrigued to read on into the series. I am hoping the rest of the series like, 
keeps getting better and better. That was Shadow and Bone. I feel like Lee Bardugo, now that I've read like a couple different things from her, like I've read Six of Crows, I've read this, I've read Ninth House, I've read The Familiar by her. I feel like she's kind of like RF Huang in terms of like every different series she writes it kind of reads like she's a different author. Like I feel like she writes very differently in her books. And that's something that I noticed with RF Kuang too. Like she just writes every single book, every single series so differently. And I feel like it's so interesting. I feel like it takes a very talented author to be able to do that, to like emulate different styles of writing. But yeah, that was Shadow and Bone. I'm definitely gonna continue in the series, but yeah, I was a little like let down from the ending of that, but I really, really, really loved the setup. I feel a lot more invested in these characters already compared to the ones in Six of Crows. <laughs> Next up, I read Emily Henry's Five Star Read, which is Life's Too Short by Abby Jimenez. This is one of Abby Jimenez is like older reads before her like newer part of your world kind of trilogy. It's a trilogy right now. I don't know if there's gonna be more in this world, but there's three right now. We follow Vanessa, who is like a travel vlogger. She's a YouTuber who travels. <laughs> she has a sister who, she has her issues. She struggles with addiction, but she has a baby that she ends up leaving with Vanessa to take care of. So Vanessa's life is completely changed. She can no longer travel for her YouTube job because she has to stay home and take care of this like literal newborn baby. She ends up meeting this you know, very good looking lawyer <laughs> who also happens to be her like across the hall neighbor and it's a romance. So we kind of know where things sort of go from there. <laughs> this is another book that I enjoyed bits of it, but parts of it I didn't like. So the first thing that kind of gave me like the mm, about this book is the fact that the main character is a YouTuber. I feel like very rarely have I read a book about like a social media person that captures the experience of being someone on social media in a genuine way. I feel like every book I've read with like an influencer as the main character feels very awkward in the way it's written. I always compare it to like how dialogue is written. Sometimes you read a book and the dialogue just feels, it feels like dialogue. Like it feels like a script. It feels not genuine. You're like, that's not the way that people talk. I found that in this book, the way that Vanessa was YouTubing was not the way that people YouTube. Like that's that's not how it works. It felt very forced and like, yeah, scripted, like fake. And so that was the first thing that gave me kind of like the, mm, like, I don't know how I feel about this. There are also a couple of like terms that Abby Jimenez kept bringing up in this book. Like crazy eyes was a term that kept being brought up. And I was like, what is crazy eyes? Like, what does that mean? And it kept being brought up kind of in like different context where like crazy eyes wouldn't mean like the same thing every time it was brought up. But like the term crazy eyes was mentioned a lot in this book. And for some reason that irked me. I also, I feel like I'm just kind of like bashing this book right now because I'm only saying negative things. But there was also like the third act conflict in this romance novel was like not one that I enjoyed. It was basically without giving away too much. The third act conflict was basically the male main character realizing something that he should have known this entire time because the female main character actually told him like to his face, like told Told him about this thing early on in the book and he for some reason just like didn't listen to it or didn't believe it and then when he realized that what she said was like an actual thing that was true that like caused the conflict it mm, it just it didn't make sense to me I didn't really like how that conflict was handled it felt like it was just something made up to throw in there to have a third act conflict and that just irks me so much. <laughs> Something that I did like about this book though is that the spice was very fade to black. And you guys know me, I'm not very like, not a spice girly. And I liked how this romance was written in a way that like wasn't all about the spice. And that could be a pro and con depending on what type of a reader you are. But I liked that there wasn't very much spice in this. I think overall this was also just like a very ambitious story to tell. So the female main character does have to address issues and concerns about chronic illness in this book. And I feel like that part of the story was so ambitious, probably so difficult to write in a way that made sense, was also respectable. And I feel like Abby Jimenez did do a good job 
with that, I think, for the most part. But yeah, this book just, it wasn't my favorite. I think bits of the writing I did like because it is still Abby Jimenez. I still really do like her writing, but I would say like this book does not live up. Like if you've read her newer releases, like Part of Your World, Yours Truly, Just for the Summer, especially Just for the Summer, I would say this book doesn't really live up, which makes sense because it was written before. So it's just really a testament to Abby herself, seeing how her writing has progressed throughout the years. It just wasn't for me. <laughs> I then went on to read the five-star read of V.E. Schwab as well as R.F. Kuang, which was Jade City by Fonda Lee. I definitely liked this book more than the previous two I had read for this reading vlog. So this is an urban fantasy. It's definitely very Asian inspired. We have like crime, gangs sort of a thing. And we have a magic system that is based in Jade, which I love. I would say if I could compare this book to something else, I feel like I've talked about Six of Crows a lot in this video already because we talked about Shadow and Bone, but I would compare this book to Six of Crows because of the sort of gang vibe we get. There's also a drug that is a very big part of the plot in Jade City, like a newly developed drug that enhances magic that was very reminiscent of the drug that was in Six of Crows that was also newly developed. But where the books are different is where Six of Crows was kind of about like one main heist. Jade City was more about like the general politics between the gangs. It was a little bit more intricate in terms of like scheming and like inter-gang communication and hierarchy and stuff like that. So I found that to be interesting. Interesting. This though was another book where in the first 30% I was like what is going on? Who is who? Where are we? <laughs> like who is affiliated with who? Who was on what side? Because I feel like this book used a lot of like, I don't know, like I don't know a lot about gangs and like gang terminology, but I feel like this book used a lot of like titles. Like certain characters were addressed by only their title for a lot of it. And like as someone who like doesn't know a lot about like gang hierarchy, I was like, wait, like what does that mean? <laughs> so that was a little confusing to me at, at first, but again, like once I got into it, I was like into it. I did end up really, really loving this book. Ended up feeling quite emotional about some of the characters and some of the things that happened. There was a, a bit of a significant death in this book without spoiling things. Someone does die and it was so sad, but I also loved that someone died because I haven't read a fantasy in a long time that was actually high stakes where people actually get hurt and people actually die without like being resurrected and coming back to life. So I found that to be really refreshing where like the people that died actually stayed dead. <laughs> I think like as I was reading this book though, and I also mentioned this when I read Six of Crows is I feel like I'm not, I'm just generally not like drawn towards books with crime gang environments. It's just not my thing, but I found that with Jade City, although I wasn't really like so into the whole gang thing, I feel like the characters were really well developed. The characters in this were amazing and they are what kept me interested in this book where like I wouldn't really be interested in like crime gang politics normally. I felt like I was more invested into this one because I did like the characters so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed Jade City. This is another series that I definitely want to continue reading. I don't know when I'm gonna get to it because I have so many books to read but yeah I'm definitely like so interested in continuing on. <laughs> okay the next book I read was a literary fiction and it was The Secret, The Secret? No, The Storied Life of AJ Fickery by Gabrielle Zevin. <gasps> Mm, okay, I'm so excited to talk about this one because I feel like the past couple of books, I did like Jade City but I feel like this month started off with kind of like meh, like so-so books. This was the book this month, I think. I think this was my favorite read this month. It was so good, it was so well-deserved. But this book follows a widowed man who lives on this island. He owns a bookstore and then he lives in an apartment above it. So his entire life is just like this bookstore in the apartment. He's very grumpy, yet literally no one on the island likes him. He's known for being this kind of like outcast, grumpy character on the island that most people try and avoid. When one day a baby is left in his bookstore with a note and he realizes that this baby is now his responsibility. And then his life just it just completely gets turned around. This book is not a very long book. I think it's like 200 something pages. And I found like at the 90 page mark, I was like so emotionally invested in the characters on such a deep level, which was so impressive. Like the strength of the connection I felt towards these characters was something that I would normally feel only towards characters that I've read like multiple books about, like in a series. I just like immediately felt so attached and invested. And I feel like the writing was 
was just so good and the character development, like they were so well written. I loved them so much. Mm, this, this book just felt like a warm hug. We did deal with sort of like more sad things like loss, grieving and like how to get over that. But we also had this beautiful romance. We also had this found family and the romance in it. This is not a romance novel at all. The romance is such a small subplot of it, but I found the romance, like the banter, the banter in this book had had no business being so good. It had no business. It was amazing. Like the banter in this book was better than the banter that I've read in so many romances. Like the majority of the romances I've read, this book killed it. The banter was amazing. It was incredible. And also there was like a sort of like mystery crime aspect to this book as well, which was also kind of like a smaller part of the plot, but I found that really fun. It just, this book had everything you would want in a book. You guys know me, I find with a lot of literary fiction, sometimes you just feel like a little bit disconnected to the characters. I feel like a lot of lit fics I've read tell their stories in sort of like a bird's eye point of view where you're like very far away, sitting very far away and watching the story unfold. This book, The Story Life of AJ Fickery, you felt just like, you felt like you were with the characters. It was amazing. Highly recommend if you're looking for something cozy, which you probably are because we're getting into September and fall, pick up this book. <laughs> Next up was Hello Stranger by Catherine Center, which is the first Catherine Center book that I've ever read. This is a romance. We follow Sadie, who is a portrait artist. At the beginning of the book, she gets into this incident, this accident, and she is left with this condition called face blindness. And there's a scientific name for it that was in the book, but I can't remember it right now. But basically she can no longer see faces. She can kind of zoom in and like analyze details. Like, okay, that's an eye, that's a nose, that's a mouth, but she can't see faces as a whole and she definitely can't recognize them. So now she has to deal with face blindness while being a literal portrait artist who like literally works in faces. And then of course there is a romance part of it. She sort of falls in love with her dog's vet <laughs> because he's like all handsome and dreamy and he's a vet and everything. And she also has this sort of a romance with one of the neighbors that lives in her building. While I was reading this book, my mind was just like breaking, like it was exploding. I couldn't wrap my mind around the concept of face blindness and like what that's like. It's funny because while I was reading this book, I was like telling Huffy about, you know, what the book was about. And he was like, I feel like I have face blindness. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? He might actually have a small case of face blindness, like a minor case, because obviously like he can see faces, he can recognize people, but he does have a hard time remembering faces. So that was funny. But yeah, back to the book. I did overall enjoy this book. I think it was funny. It ended up being a very, very cute story, but my biggest problem with this book was the female main character, Sadie, was so annoying. She was supposed to be an adult, but she was not acting like an adult at all. And I get that throughout the book, she was struggling with this face blindness thing. She had to figure out her life. She was stressed. Girl, you know, she had a reason to be chaotic. Her life was falling apart, but she would do these things like just like run out onto the street in her pajamas and like her robe and her slippers and stuff. And like, not just like run out onto the street and like see someone for five minutes or get a package or whatever and come back up. She would like walk like blocks to like go see her vet in her pajamas or she would like go meet, I think it was her dad. She would go meet her dad for coffee, like a full coffee date wearing like a robe and slippers. And I'm like, girl, like put some clothes on, like get dressed, you are an adult woman. I'm sure you can get your life together for five minutes to throw on even like sweatpants, sweatpants and a t-shirt. Like you don't have to be parading around, what was it, New York City where this was set? Like you don't have to be parading around the entire city in your like pink fuzzy robe and pink fuzzy slippers. You really don't. So like stuff like that really bugged me. Also when she met the vet in this book, this is not spoilers, this is just vibes. But when she met the vet in this book that she kind of fell in love with, the way her crush developed was so high school. She started like thinking of her as like Sadie with her last name as like the vet's last name. I don't remember the last name, but like, you know, she's like Mrs. Sadie, whatever. Picturing that, writing that in her diary, like that kind of a vibe. I was like, are we 12? Are we 12 <laughs> or are we like 
30. <laughs> oh, here it is. I did write it down in my notes. She was 28 years old and she was acting this way. So she was very annoying and her friend was also very annoying. But once you get past that, the story is good. It is very cute. I found the ending to be very, very extremely predictable, but I still liked the way things played out. So I would still recommend this book. It felt like a warm hug. Just like be warned, you might get a little bit annoyed at the main character's antics. We went back into thriller mode and I read a Talent for Murder by Peter Swanson. Another kind of iffy read for me. So this was a thriller about Martha who meets a stranger, gets tossed up in the sort of whirlwind romance and ends up marrying a guy that she's only known for I think like six months or something like that. She is content in this marriage when one day she starts suspecting her husband of being a serial killer, <laughs> a literal murderer. She starts freaking out, starts looking into things and that's where the book begins. I found the premise of this book to be really intriguing. I was really excited to read this but I feel like the way the story was structured and told was very strange. There were a lot of strange choices made in this book. So first of all, we had a couple different POVs, which I think were okay in terms of like who we got the POVs from, but something that was weird was some of the POVs were told in third person and some of them were in first person. And when I think back to it, the decision kind of makes sense a little bit, but it also kind of spoils the book in a way, kind of like ruins the timeline and was kind of jarring every time it switched. And I don't want to give away too much like I can't I feel like I can't say too much because like it's a thriller like I, I can't give away what happens or like how the story progresses because yeah I don't know it was a weird one just like the timeline of it the way things were written the point of views that certain parts were written in I was like why why? Like that was such a strange choice. I feel like the story had a lot of potential, but it just, it did not do it for me. All the twists also I predicted. I feel like also we were not dealing with very many characters. There were kind of like three or four main players in the game. It was just very obvious where the story was going because there weren't that many options to guess from. And yeah, I just, I didn't really enjoy it. I'm sorry. There was no suspense. It wasn't exciting. and and it wasn't for me, but that's okay. I then read Five Feet Apart by Rachel Lippincott, which is a movie that I watched years and years and years ago, made me bawl my eyes out. I decided to read the book this past month and the book also made me bawl my eyes out. So very emotional story. This is, what would this be? categorized under. It's definitely a romance, but it's also very sad. It also deals with chronic illness. It's YA. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you what it's about. So we follow Stella who has cystic fibrosis. At the start of the book, she is in the hospital for treatment. She's waiting for like replacement lungs. She's basically been in and out of the hospital for as long as she can remember. She's also on social media. So she, she documents online just her journey of, of how she's doing and how she deals with her CF. She meets Will, who is also admitted into the same hospital that she's in, also for cystic fibrosis, but he has like a different strain or like an added strain of a bacteria that can be very, very fatal if transferred to her. So basically she has to stay six feet apart from him at all costs because she cannot get this thing transmitted to her because if she does, she's no longer eligible for the new lungs that she's been waiting for. So she has to keep her distance, which at the beginning of the book, she's like fine with because Will is like completely opposite from her. So Stella's very like type A kind of, like takes all her medication at the right time, really into her treatments, really organized. Will on the other hand is very much like, I don't care about my treatments. I just wanna leave the hospital, live my life, go travel. I have limited time on this earth anyways. I just wanna like live it to its fullest. I don't care about the treatments and so they don't really get along. They clash at the beginning of the book, but for whatever reason, they just keep getting intertwined and bumping into each other. Not literally, because they have to stay six feet apart from each other, but they keep like bumping into each other while they're at the hospital and their lives get intertwined and it becomes this beautiful, heartbreaking, romantic, story. It's just one of those that you can't experience without ugly crying. Mm, the story is so good. I feel like I did like the movie a little, little bit better than the book. Also, fun fact, the movie is directed by Justin Baldoni, who is like, you know, the director of It Ends With Us also plays Ryle, but he also, yeah, he directed Six Feet Apart, which I actually didn't even know 
until now because I like looked it up again. But I feel like I enjoyed the movie a bit better just because the book does read very YA. I feel like with like romance books, especially when they're written YA, I obviously can't relate to them as much because I'm 31 years old. So yeah, I did enjoy the book. I don't know how I would like the book if I hadn't seen the movie first just because it was so YA, but because I knew the story already and knew what I was getting into, I feel like I did really, really enjoy the book. It was very fast read, very emotional. Definitely a good story to get into if you want a good cry. That was five feet apart. I went back to another Catherine Center because now I'm obsessed with Catherine Center. I read The Rom-Commers. This is another romance, but in this one we follow Emma, who's a screenwriter who gets hired to like ghost write essentially for one of her like big idol screenwriters who also happens to be very attractive and she has like photos of him on her wall in her bedroom. Like she just, she's obsessed with this man and she ends up being hired to ghost write for him. She goes to meet him and realizes he is not which she expected at all. <laughs> That's the premise of this book. Again, it's a romance, so I'm sure you can see where it's going. It's like, it's not very mind blowing in terms of it's like unpredictable and unpredictability. Is that the word? Unpredictability. It's definitely very predictable, but it's very cute. I do really like Catherine Center's writing. So I am just like eating her romances up now. Ooh, something I also really like about Catherine Center is that she doesn't write spicy books but she writes great romances without spice, so it's perfect for me. <laughs> if I were to compare this book to Hello Stranger, which I just talked about, I feel like the start of the rom-commers was better, but I feel like the ending of Hello Stranger was better. I also think that like, so our male main character in this book is supposed to be grumpy. We definitely have like grumpy sunshine trope in this book, but I find that the male main character wasn't actually that grumpy. Like he was kind of grumpy for the first five minutes of the book and then just like completely turned around his personality. So it wasn't really a good grumpy sunshine. I found his character to be very not consistent in terms of like the way he was written, but you know what? It's okay. I found this book to be another very easy read, another very cute romance, and that was The Rom-Commers. And I am still excited to read more of Catherine Center because I am finding her writing very enjoyable to read. I don't know if you just heard that, but that was my dishwasher going off. Anyways, what did I read next? I read Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. This was basically Bridgerton, but with a little bit of magic. I really, really liked this book. It, the vibes were really, really good. It was cozy. Another really good one to read as the fall months start. We follow Dora, who at the beginning of this book meets this fairy, this evil fairy who takes half of her soul. So she is left as this kind of like quirky character because half of her emotions are now gone because that half of her soul is what was taken. And now she's very like muted in her emotions. Like she doesn't really feel extremely happy ever. She never feels extremely sad or scared. Like she just doesn't have heightened emotions. And she also has like no filter. Whatever she thinks, she just says, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But yeah, we're set in like Regency England. I think it's Regency England. And we have sort of like Bridgerton vibes because we have these characters like coming out to society, kind of like trying to find a husband, literally Bridgerton. But yeah, we have this twist because we have our character with half a soul. We have this mystery with these fairies. Hi, Sage, are you okay? <laughs> she's telling me to hurry up with this wrap up. But yeah, because Dora is so quirky, she's like having a hard time finding a husband, but then she meets this character called the Lord Sorcier or Sorcier. I don't know if he's supposed to be French or not, who has the potential to maybe help her with her little soul dilemma. This is definitely a very cozy book. It's a cozy fantasy. It's not high stakes at all, which is very interesting because I feel like cozy fantasy with low stakes is something that I have not in the past enjoyed very much. Like when I read the Emily Wilde series, the Encyclopedia of Fairies, I thought it was okay, but I felt a little bit like bored with that genre. I thought it was maybe not my thing, but I did like this one, I did like Half a Soul and it had the same sort of like cozy low stakes vibes, but in a way that I liked. I think I just liked the style of writing in this better. I did get a little bit, I think, bored maybe near the end of the book because I felt like the plot was like dragging a little bit long. But overall, yeah, I found this to be really cozy. I really liked it. The writing is amazing in this book. It's very beautiful. The romance is also very cute. And yeah, I really liked it. Highly recommend. 
for the fall, another fall book to read onto your autumn reading list. The next one I read is the graphic novel I read. So I read Hover Girls by Geneva Bowers. This is a book that Bloomsbury very kindly gifted to me. So I decided to give the graphic novel a try because I have not ever read a graphic novel. Actually, when I was younger, I used to read like the Archie comics. I don't know if that counts, but that's probably the most experience I've had with graphic novels. This one followed two sisters. I think they were sisters, right? No, they were cousins. And at the beginning of the book, they're like on the beach. A water fish thing appears in the sky and then they get magical powers all of a sudden and it just like follows them as they kind of become like super girls but not really i didn't really understand or enjoy this book very much i feel like the story was very chaotic it didn't really make sense it was kind of back and forth between scenes like scenes would be literally like cut in the middle of them and then we would like jump back in time but then the scene we jumped back in time with had nothing to do with the current scene and then we would never revisit the unfinished scene it would be like an unfinished scene, like just forever. Like I still don't know what happened in that scene. And it was very irritating. I unfortunately did not like it. I did think the art in this book was very good. I liked the art style in it and I had fun looking at the images. But yeah, in terms of the story, it just didn't make sense to me. I feel like there was no point in it as well. Like at the end of the book, I was like, what did I learn from that? I don't understand. I feel like maybe Geneva Bowers is a really good illustrator, but her storytelling I feel like did not hit. I didn't care what was going on. I didn't know what was going on. And I don't know if it was just like, because I don't normally read graphic novels, but yeah, it just wasn't straightforward to me. I didn't get it, but that's okay. Maybe I'll try another graphic novel. I know a lot of people talk about the Heartstopper series. I wonder if I tried that, if I would like those. Let me know if you've tried Heartstopper or if you have any other like graphic novel suggestions because it seems like a fun genre to get into. Just to like, I don't know, take a break from books with so many words, jump into an illustrated graphic novel. I feel like that'd be fun once in a while, but this one didn't do it for me. Okay, I then read my hundredth book of the year, which was The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. I'm not gonna talk about this one too much because I did do an entire video dedicated to pretty much reading this book. That was my hundredth book video for this year, but this is a mystery romance series. We follow a girl named Avery, who is a high school student. She's really struggling to make ends meet. It's basically just like her and her older sister taking care of each other because her mother, was it her mother? Her mother passed away and her father's just like, absent. At the beginning of the book, she gets called to the principal's office at school and is told that for whatever reason, this billionaire who just died has put her in his will. And so she goes, she realizes how the heck much she has inherited from this billionaire that she does not know. Like she, she has never met or seen or heard of this man in her entire life. And all of a sudden he's left her this inheritance. So Avery and her sister go to Hawthorne House, which is the estate, and start unraveling these like mysteries. This billionaire grandfather that just died has always been known in his family for like leaving riddles, clues, games and stuff. So it seems like in his death, he has left all of these like unsolved riddles for Avery and for his four sons to figure out. And so that's what this book is. It's very much like mystery riddles, games, puzzles. I found this book to be like literal crack. It was so addictive, so fun. I was actually pleasantly surprised because I thought this was gonna be more of a billionaire romance, but it was a lot more of just like the mystery side of it. The romance was very much subplot and we got a lot of like, yeah, the mystery, the riddles, and I found it was so, Fun. The setting was also like really fun as well. We're set in the estate and there's a lot of secret passages, like hidden doors, kind of like escape room vibes. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm excited to continue on in the series. I think there are like four books out so far. There's like a spin-off series that's also going on. There's also a love triangle in this book, which was like, I thought I hated love triangles, but now that I'm like starting to read more books with love triangles again, I'm like, they're kind of fun. <laughs> so yeah, that's the inheritance games. Just like completely addictive. I, I wish I found this series earlier because I feel like 
I would have had so much fun reading this like years ago, but I'm also so happy finding this now because I'm also having so much fun reading this now. <laughs> okay, and then I'm not gonna talk about the next five books I read so much because I basically started rereading the Throne of Glass series, which you guys know is literally one of my favorite series of all time. So I reread The Assassin's Blade, Throne of Glass, Crown of Midnight, Air of Fire, and Queen of Shadows. I just had a lot of fun rereading them. Part of the reason why I jumped into the reread is I went to a trivia event this month and I just wanted a refresher before the trivia event so we could like do better for our team. But I've also been looking for a reason to like jump back into this world because it, as I said, it's just like one of my faves. But yeah, if you don't know what Throne of Glass is, we start off the series following an assassin named Selena Sardothian who has been enslaved for a year. She gets plucked out of the salt mines that she has been a slave in to participate in this contest to become the king's champion, which would basically be like the king's assassin. She's facing 23 other contestants who are all sorts of like assassins, thieves, just like people who are on the wrong side of the law but like very talented in killing people. She faces all of them in this competition to have her chance at getting the job of King's Champion and also a chance at freedom. And then the story just like goes on. It becomes much more complicated. It's way more than just like a story of an assassin and some trials, trust me. It starts off very basic but it goes on to this like like the most epic, magical, emotional story that is just tied together so well. Like, I literally get so emotional thinking about it. But yeah, I read those five books up to Queen of Shadows. I decided to stop my reread because I feel like I need to get into other books again. First of all, to make reading vlogs for you guys. And then second of all, just to read something else. But I'm, I think I'm gonna continue like the last three books, probably like at the end of this month or beginning of October. I definitely wanna finish the reread, but yeah, for now, I've stopped my reread at Queen of Shadows, but such a good experience rereading them. Those are the 17 books I read in August. I'm really excited, yeah, as I mentioned, to get into more like fall read in September and going into October. That's it. That's it for now. <laughs> I hope you liked this video. If you did, please leave me a like and a comment. If you don't know what to comment down below, let me know what your favorite read in August was. If you like me, subscribe, do that bell thing, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.